John chapter 12, and um, good to have you all here tonight, had a good week studying and trying to get everything done and rebooted and restarted and all of that good stuff. I just like it when it works, finally. I get excited. I go, woohoo, it works. And then people think I'm crazy. Uh, we've been in John 12 for a while, but this should be close to the, to the end of it. And then in John chapter 13, uh, John chapter 13 is when in the gospel of John, uh, Jesus uh, partakes of the Last Supper. This is where we find out who is going to betray uh, Jesus. Um, and, and I'll say this, and I'll probably, I'll probably deal more with this uh, when we get into John 13, uh, but it's on my mind now. If you live for Jesus Christ, and I mean really live for Him, and your, your heart is, is, it belongs to God. God directs your paths. God guides you. God leads you. You serve God. You worship God with all that you have. I promise you, you're going to have at least one Judas in your life. At least one. If Christ can have a Judas... You can, you're going to have one too. And um, it's amazed me that, you know, Michael had this dream of just starting a radio station. Yeah. And, um, you know, I saw it when I finally decided to go along with it. I saw it as an a, a evangelization tool, a way to to get the, the truth of the gospel out to the people of Kenya. It's not that there's no churches. In fact, Kenya, um, there's a lot of churches in Kenya. And um, some of them okay, some of them not okay, just like there are here. Um, but just get the truth out there. And uh, regardless of what, some people think about it. Like I say, we've had uh, the Roman Catholic Church come to both of our stations, Samburu and Turkana, and say, you need to get that guy off the station. He's, he's saying bad things about the Catholic Church. You need to get him off of there. And they said, well, we can't take him off. Well, how come? Well, he owns the station. And uh, then they get very upset. The Jehovah's Witness or excuse me, the Seventh-day Adventists, same way. Seventh-day Adventists have a lot of churches in Kenya. And um, when they started hearing what I had to say about their religion and doctrine, they didn't like it. They sent people down to the station, told, told them to get that guy off of there, and they need to quit putting him on there. He's saying bad things about the... He's telling lies. Well... How could I be telling lies about their church when I was reading directly from their prophet, Ellen White? I mean, I was reading directly from her. So there's no way I could be lying about their religion because I was reading the words of their prophet, Ellen White. They just didn't like the scriptures that I gave that proved that she's a liar. And uh, so anyway, um, we had, th clearly they were against us. But then over the course of time, we found out that there were Judases among us in those stations working on the inside to destroy or try to destroy uh, what was being done over there. And I simply say it this way. If God's in it, can't destroy it. 
If God is not in it, it needs to be destroyed. Amen? So, however, whatever God wants to do with that, he'll do it. I promise you that he'll do it. Uh, but anyway, that's coming up in, in John chapter uh, 13. John chapter 12, you have your Bible open on the screen. We're going to read this, have a word of prayer. My notes, verse 20, um, Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, that stood by and heard it and said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now this judgment and now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death. He and I don't think I'm in the right spot. So I'm going to move forward real fast to John 12, 44. That's where I wanted to be. Jesus Christ said, he, he, now pay attention to this. He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And who sent Jesus? God the Father. So Jesus is saying, if you accept me, you accept God, God the Father, if you reject Jesus, you are rejecting the most high God. It's as simple as that. Jesus has declared, uh, the Bible says he thought it not robbery to make himself equal with God. In other words, Jesus made himself equal with God and didn't think that he was committing any blasphemy at all. It's because he knew that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's what he knows. In verse 45, And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Jesus said, No man has seen the Father at any time. But if you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. In verse 46, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if there was anything that I struggled with for years, early on in, in my life, it was, I was in darkness, and I didn't like it. I wanted to be out of that darkness. I wanted light. And he said in verse 47, now he's going to link it together. If any man hear my word and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life Everlasting, whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings. There's a lot here tonight. Just packed up in this last part of this chapter. I pray, dear God, that you would give us understanding of it. And help us to see, Father, the connection. Not, not the connection that I make. The connection that you have already made between what you said as God Almighty 
And what Jesus said as the Son of God, what Jesus said as the Word of God, what we have spoken in our Bibles, which we call the Word of God, that they are always and everlastingly one and the same, and there is no difference between them. Help us to see that, Father. Help us to believe it. And Father, if we get a chance, maybe, Lord, we can share it with others. And bless your people tonight. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I had a, um, a turn to um, uh, Psalm 119. I, I had a, a thought, uh, I think today, of um, just having like a class on Wednesday night where I could teach you how to answer most people's objections to why we believe the King James Bible which basically we're saying why we believe that the Bible right now is absolutely perfect, that right now the Bible has no mistakes in it whatsoever, that right now the Bible still is the preserved Word of God, it is still perfect, because you might have uh, friends and family members that when you say, uh, listen, uh, we would we would think about going to church with you, but if your church doesn't use the King James, we're just not going, and that's all there is to it. Now, they may throw a fit. They may call you all kinds of weird names or whatever, and if you get into a conversation with them, would you know how to answer some of the questions that they will ask you? And I can tell you, it's as simple, answering them back is as simple as quoting scripture. Because if you quote scripture to somebody and they want to argue with that, who are they arguing with? They're not arguing with you. Their argument is with God. Okay. Uh, Psalm 119. Uh, let me see if I've had this memorized right. 105. What does that verse say? Somebody read that out loud tonight. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that's what Jesus is saying here in John 12. That in verse 46, I am come a light into the world. He's come to shine the light for people to see. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What was it that Gideon's men were holding in their hands? Lanterns, lamps. And so when they broke the pitchers and they shined the light, they said these words, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And it, the light, it was the light that scared their enemies. Because they figured behind every light, there must be three or 4,000 men behind every light. Uh-oh, we're dead, we better run. And there wasn't but 300 of them. Okay, but that, it, the light literally, literally uh, shook them off. Uh, let's see here. Turn to, uh, while well, you're in Psalm, turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. These verses deal with Christ, who is the light. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork day unto day utter his speech. Night into night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them meaning the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. And then he says in verse 5, the sun is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. 
And he's talking about Christ. Right there, he's talking about Christ. He's the bridegroom, and he's the son coming out of his chamber in the east to meet the bride there in the west. Turn to, um, turn to uh, Malachi. No, yeah, Malachi chapter 4. Verse 2, but unto you that fear my name shall the son. Notice they capitalized the word son, the letter S and the word son. They, they knew who that was. Shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. The son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. Uh, not too far over from there. Matthew 17. Matthew 17. In verse 1. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. That must have been bright. It would have been like there was two suns on that day. The sun up in the sky and the one on top of that mountain. Okay. Um, let's see here. How about Revelation chapter 1? Turn there. Revelation chapter 1. John is praying. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day. He's having church. He's having church. Is it possible for you... If there is no one else around, is it possible for you to have church on the Lord's day by yourself? It sure is. John did it. He was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. It, no other Christians over there. and He was in the spirit on. They made sure he was there. That reminds me of a story that uh, years ago, this happened... Uh, right after World War II, there was a, a man, an American pilot, that got shot down. And uh, he wasn't too far from this island. So he swam over to this island. And, uh, of course, he was afraid there was, you know, Japanese on that island. Well, he searched around, couldn't find any. So he just realized he was there by himself. And he just made the best of it. Well, they had him as, you know, missing in action. And 10 years later, um, somewhere around 1953, 54, uh, the United States Navy was searching out these islands. They were looking for a place to do nuclear testing and all that. And they came on this island and they saw that man still in his uniform. And they're going, how long have you been here? And the guy said, well, what year is it? They said, well, it's 1953. He said, well, I've been here 10 years. And they couldn't believe it. He's, that he was still alive. He did, was in good shape. And they said, how have you existed all this time? He said, well, come in here. I'll show you. He went in the woods a little bit in the forest. And he had him a, just like a whole little town built in there. He kept his stores, any food that he had, in a little place that he called the, the store. And he had a, uh, he had a, like a, uh, a, 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 just different buildings around, had him a nice house, you know, and on, on one side of the street, there was a, he had a church there. And they were looking at that and they were going, you even built a church? And he said, well, yeah. He said, my mom and daddy taught me right. And he said, I realized that I was here and still alive by the grace of God. And he said, every day on the Lord's Day, I'd go in there with my Bible that I had my kit. And he said, I'd go in there and, and have church and serve the Lord. 
When they got to looking around, they noticed that just down the road a little bit and across the street was another building looked just like a church. And they said, well, what is that building down there? He said, which I used to go to. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? Anyway, he must have got mad at somebody and then left. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, here's John on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. And he hears a voice behind him and he turns around. He sees one in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. And in um, verse 16, the Bible says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in it, uh, shineth in his strength. So we have all these places in the Bible that equates Jesus Christ as the sun. Son, he's the son, he's the son. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai the second time, his face was lit up so bright they couldn't look at him. Moses then was a foreshadowing of Christ who when he comes, he's coming and he is the son of righteousness. Somebody say amen. Son, S-U-N of God. All right, that's why he said in verse 46, I am come a light into the world. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 would tell us that we then are, because we are born again with Christ, that we are children of the day. And that that day should not overtake us as a thief. So he says, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And uh, I don't know why it is. I think it's because God designed the psychological nature of mankind. That when somebody gets very, very deep. Physical darkness. I was teaching this one time at uh, a church down in Arkansas. And a, a, a fellow pastor, a, f a friend of mine, um, he, came, he heard me say that. And I said, when you start seeing churches, turn off all the lights down in the sanctuary. There's a spirit there. I guarantee you there's a spirit there. And um, this pastor came up to me and he said, Mike, he said, I wanted to talk to you about that. He said, that's interesting. You brought that up. We've got a guy that, you know, we use him as kind of a youth pastor. And he said, we've got a building that, where all the youth go to, and um, which I'm not in favor of. I am not in favor of that. Uh, there's just too much goes on now that parents and the people of the church don't know about. Um, and in some cases, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. In some cases, it's the youth pastors you got to watch out for as far as pedophiling on your children. Uh, there was one that they just caught down in Florida, busted him. They're all over the place. But anyway, he told me, he said, we've got a youth pastor and he said he's, you know, he takes the youth into this, you know, gymnasium, I guess, where they got Family Life Center, whatever. And they have church in there. And he said he is constantly, it's a battle constantly between me and him. He is always wanting to turn the lights down low when they have church in there. I said, don't let him do it. You're the pastor. You're in charge. I said, that just tells me that there's a spirit. I don't know this guy. I don't know who he is. I don't know where you got him. I don't care. That indicates a spirit. I mean, think about it. Roy, have you ever been in some lit tavern? Even if it was, you were too drunk to notice, right? Yeah. They meet in dark places. 
They like it dark. Teenagers who are into certain types of music, they want the lights off. They want their walls painted black. They want to wear all black. Okay? I'm not, I'm not against wearing a black shirt or something like that, but you get what I'm saying. And they just love darkness. And one of the things that if you really want Christ in your life, that must mean that you are tired of living in the darkness and you want light. You want the light. You want the light of Christ to shine on you. You want the light of God to show you things in you that are not right between you and God. That's what that is. And so then he's, it says in verse 47, now he's going to connect the Bible in with this. This is why I went through all those verses. And Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. He said in verse 47, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Amen. And he said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Who in here has ever been inside of a court? I'm not saying that you were on trial for anything. Okay, whether it's in that courtroom or the judge's chambers, there are copies of the Missouri codified statutes in all the volumes that it takes to put all of Missouri laws down on paper and printed in books. There is a copy usually accessible in every courtroom in the state of Missouri. I'm just speaking of Missouri because we're under Missouri law. Federal law would be, if you went to a federal court, it would be federal law and all these books. But all of those books, if you go to a courthouse in Jefferson County, you go to a courthouse in Franklin County, you go to a courthouse in St. Charles County, are they all going to be the exact same books? Sure they are. They are, the, they are the books that contain the laws of the state of Missouri. I remember years ago, my mom and dad, uh, they used to rent out property and they had a, a couple guys in there. They were trying to get out, couldn't get them out. And uh, so they, they took them to court. And uh, back then it was Judge Kramer. He was on the small claims court at that time. And I remember seeing him literally. He, was, he had heard both sides. And he turned around behind him. And he grabbed a law book down. And he was looking up. He was just to make sure that he knew exactly what the law said. And he was going to make his judgment... You know, I know some judges are corrupt, but do you think that judge really cared between my mom and dad and the people they were trying to get out of their mobile home that they rented? Do you think that judge really cared who won that case? I guarantee you nobody bribed him. Okay? He was just going to judge by the law that was in that book. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. He turned around, grabbed a book, and he opened it up, and he's reading it. And he says, I'll give you my decision. But what he wanted to do was make sure that he understood the particular law that applied to that particular case. Was it the judge that judged them or was it the law that judged them? It was the law. It was the law. And that's how it's going to be. Those who reject 
God's word. You're not going to you're not you're not being judged by the church. You're not going to be judged by uh, the preachers. You're not going to be judged by the popes. You're not going to be judged by Mary. You're not going to be judged by Joseph. You're going to be judged by the law itself. And that's why the law always has to be written down and recorded. Because no, no Congress, no judge, no police officer has the right to just pull you over and make up a law because they don't like you or they don't like something you did. They don't just have the right to give you a fine or write you a ticket or put you in handcuffs and take you to jail simply because they don't like what you did and they don't like what you said or they don't like how you look. They have no right to do that. The only thing they can do is go by what is written in the law. See where I'm going with this? So, does it matter if there is one copy of the law and then all of a sudden now, all these other copies of the law show up and there's things missing out of them. Does that matter? Let's say that you got into a dispute over the, the, the property line between you and your neighbor. And let's say it's important because gold was found on your property line. Lots of it. Your neighbor somehow, someway knows somebody down at the courthouse and they are able to get to the, the original title and change the numbers on there so it looks like the property line and the gold falls on their side and not your side. So now we have two different versions of the deed to the land. Who's going to get the gold? Does, does that make a difference? Yes, it makes a difference. Because somebody's going to get rich and somebody's going to lose out. So, it dawned on me years ago, when I accepted the Lord as my Savior, nine years old, the preacher, I can't remember who it was, we was at Bible camp, he came down and he was reading, this would have been 1975, 1975, nine years old, so he would have been reading out of a King James, because that's all there was. And when I got saved, I got saved by the Word of God in the King James Bible. So now they come along with all these different Bibles. And now he's not the only begotten son. He's the one and only son. And now they keep changing the words. And I'm sorry, but that's not the contract that I agreed to. Even at nine years old, that is not the contract that I agreed to. So that's why Jesus is saying this. He said, you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to be a man. That judges you. It's not going to be some council that judges you. It's going to be a book of the law that's going to uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're still looking up. On the screen here, um, yeah, I like this. Verse 49 up here on the screen says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, 
what I should say and what I should speak. Now, how did he do that? Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, we know how it was done. Because by inspiration of God, the writer of Hebrews was allowed to see a scene in heaven that no man's ever seen. He saw God before Jesus was Verse, um, let's see here. Verse, well, I just saw it. Six, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Verse seven, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So when Jesus says here, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, He gave me commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. We have here exactly how it happened. God said, Jesus, here's the book. You know the book. You know what's in the book. You are the book. So when you go down the earth, if there's any question on what you should do, just do it according to the book. Amen? Um, I'm just going to run this by you real quickly. What is the procedure? If, let's say that somebody in our church... Um, is having an ongoing affair with somebody and you know people hear about it and so on and they they continue to do this and they're not repenting what's the procedure that we as the church they're a member let's say they're a member here and, and do we just let that go What's the procedure? Okay, there's a, there's a whole list of rules. That number one, someone is to go to them privately. And see, I like this. Because when the Holy Ghost comes to you about your sin, how does he do it? Privately. You know why? He's wanting you to repent. And then once you do, it's gone. It's over with. Okay? And if God knows that you will repent, you can guarantee the Holy Ghost is going to come to you every time you do something wrong. And He's going to deal with you. And you're going you're gonna to repent. And then it's over with. But let's say that that's not working. So someone finds out about it. And they have an obligation then to go to that person. With fear. And prayer. And, and say, look, I love you. I, I, I don't come here bearing a sword or a rod to beat you to death. I want you to know I'm a sinner too. And I understand. But, I mean, we're both members of the church. And according to the Bible, it has to be done this way. You know, I know what's going on. Will you repent? Now, if they repent right then, does anybody else get to know about it? No. Nobody. It's, it's a closed deal. Because the whole point of that is restoration. Okay? But then, if they try to deny it, 
or they say, you know what? Your sins are no worse than mine. Won't you mind your own business? Or whatever kind of attitude they get. They don't repent. The second step is to take a witness. Now we've got somebody else who knows what's going on. And they're saying, we want you to repent. We're begging you to repent. Well, I'm not going to repent. I love this woman. I'm going to, I think I'm going to keep her. If they won't repent then, this is where it gets bad. Because then there has to be a special meeting of the church called. And that person gets to be there. And they pick just various men out of the congregation. Not necessarily the pastor, just various men. Men who have no big place in the church. Men who are not the wealthy of the church. And men who are not related to anybody involved in this. They just pick some men out of the church to be judges. And they invite this person and say, these are the charges. You've been found in adultery. And we want you to repent. We want you to fellowship with us. We don't want to lose you. All have sinned and come short of the glory. It could be any one of us here. Will you please repent? And if they don't do it then, then... Those who are the judges must then pass judgment upon that person. And because they have not repented, the only judgment in that case is to say, we must put them out. And that's a big thing because that is in the same place as where Jesus said, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I think that if it has to go that far in the church, and that church has to put them out of that congregation, I think it's very possible that God puts them out forever. Could be wrong on that. I hope I'm wrong on that. But that's the procedure that has to be done. And it all has to, and it has to be judged according to the book. It has to be judged according to the book. So he said, I've not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say. We read that in Hebrews 10. And what I should speak. In verse 50. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore. Even as the father said unto me. So I speak. So I want you to think of this. And then we'll close. In the Old Testament. It was Moses who had this job. God raised up Moses. And God gave Moses. A commandment, a covenant. He said, here's ten laws. If you obey these laws, you shall live in the land that I have promised you. That I have sworn to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But if you will not live by these commandments, then I cannot let you live in this land that I swore to your fathers. I can't let you do it. And even though God long suffered with them. For hundreds of years. God finally had to force them out. God this, this commandment. That he gave through Moses. Was actually. And we talked about this here a while back. This was actually. 
an engagement. It was a betrothal. God said, I'll be your husband. You'll be my wife. But because Israel went out and constantly played the harlot, finally God said, I've got to write you a bill of divorce. I can't, I, I, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And uh, so now the same. God says, or Jesus says, my father gave me a commandment, what I should say. And we have two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Love them. Those commandments there are liberal. We can do those. If you decide to, but you can love people. Especially if you have the gifts of the Spirit in you helping you to love people. So now we have a new commandment that doesn't just give us life in a land in the Middle East. It gives us life everlasting in heaven. And I like that one. Amen? I like that one.